This is the John Campia Podcast, Episode 1, for Monday, March the 7th, 2016. Hey guys, on this episode, Aaron and I are going to be talking about the 21 Jump Street Men in Black crossover. What are they smoking? Sony's planning a Venom movie without Spider-Man. Bruce Willis doing Death Wish. Zack Snyder saying Superman just can't win. Why are we doing this podcast in the first place? And a whole lot more. So sit back, relax. The John Campia podcast starts right now. Well, hey guys, and welcome to the show, our inaugural uh, episode of the John Campia podcast. Thanks so much. For joining us here today and i am of course joined by the wonderful aaron sharoni aaron how you doing i am excellent i'm so excited to be doing this with you and i am excited to be doing this with you too and well i'll probably go a little bit into the story about how uh, you got involved with me and and all this kind of stuff too but uh, i know it sounds like we are sitting in the same room but we are not i am in burbank <laughs> And Aaron is in Miami, actually, right now. So, Aaron, just because a lot of the people who are going to be listening to the first couple episodes of this show, um, they're more familiar with me already. But tell people a little bit about yourself. Like, you have a background in sports journalism and DJing and all this kind of, like, really cool, eclectic stuff. Just tell people a little bit about Aaron Sharoni. Listeners, this is another way of saying <laughs> these seemingly disparate, unconnected <laughs> topics, <laughs> <laughs> which is fine because I get that all the time. But I assure you, there is a thread. Um, yeah, so I, I live here in South Beach. I've been here for a couple years. I moved down here for my role on CBS Sports. So um, yes, I uh, have a background in sports broadcasting and journalism. Um, I did that for about five years. I'm originally from New York City, by the way. So I got my start uh, with Darren Ravel um, with on uh, sports business on NBC Sports, and he right. was he was obviously the sports business reporter on CNBC. Um, before that, I was with St. John's Basketball, actually. So that really technically gave me my start in New York. Um, but before that, I <laughs> now is where it seems disparate. I worked on <laughs> Wall Street for six years as a trader, um, went to school for art and architecture. Uh, and I'm also a musician. So I was always doing sort of the DJ electronic dance music thing. Um, I know it seems so separate, but kind of like one thing was supposed to support the other, but the arts, the arts was really the background, right? So performing, whether it was on television, talking about sports or uh, DJing parties or, you know, creating art itself, it's all kind of similar, similar self-expression, right? That the, the Wall Street thing was really the outlier. And you and um, I actually, you and I actually first met because you do another podcast um, called yep. Evolver. Yes. Um, and, um, our mutual friend, Chris Bunker actually connected us and I was super excited when he did. Cause I was like, huh, I've had all of these directors on, but I haven't had a film critic on. And then I realized, of course, I was like, wait, I'm a star Wars geek. I'm a star Trek nerd. And uh, that's obviously your space. So it was a good introduction. <laughs> and, and then, so what happened, this was about, I guess, I don't know, four or five, six months ago that we did that Evolver interview and then when I was doing this show, um, I thought I was just going to do it by myself because of the flexibility I needed to do it. But then it, as it turned out, you're like, hey, I actually work from home. So it's like, perfect. And we had a chance to do this <laughs> together, which I'm really excited about. And I can't wait for people to get to know you a little bit better. Um, and with that out of the way, we're going to jump into a bunch of stuff here, as we mentioned off the top here. we got a whole bunch of topics to go into. Uh, and the first topic we're going to go into, the number one topic today Talking a little bit about the box office this weekend. Now, you know, I'm not going to lead off every Monday by talking about the box office and all that, but Zootopia. Um, mm -hmm. I saw, I was lucky enough, I got to go to the world premiere of Zootopia. Disney usually invites me to their world premieres, and they always have a really, really nice shindig when they do these things. But I was not expecting a lot because the trailers, I mean, I didn't even like the first trailer or two. To Zootopia. The sloth, I, I, the sloth one? Well, no, 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 no. That one, the, the sloth one is the one that got me on board. Like before that, <laughs> I'd seen a couple of previews and I'm like, eh, this kind of feels like a throwaway Disney animated film. But I went to go see it. I really enjoyed it. Like it, I'm not going to say it's on the same level as like some of the better Pixar stuff. Like it's not on the same level as Inside Out or anything like that. But I had a really good time watching it. It was really fun. It was a very creative notion, a very creative idea. Um, but I be, I'll be honest with you. I was expecting 
I thought a good result for it would be like $50 million. And it ended up making 73, almost $74 million in its opening weekend, which is just crazy. Uh, London has fallen was number two. I went to go see London has fallen this week. I don't know if you had a chance to see it yet, Aaron. I I really want to see it though. I see because I liked the first one. I liked um, Olympus has fallen, which if you remember, came out around the same time as the Channing Tatum, Jamie Foxx movie, White House Down. And they basically, the advertisements for both of them made them kind of look, yeah. And they kind of look like the same movie. So I made the mistake, they they really did. And I made the mistake of seeing White House Down first. And it fucking sucks. Like it was (laughs) awful. Oh, but how do you really feel? Oh my God. It was so bad. And I, I mean, I have come around to really, I used to not like Channing Tatum for a very long time, but he has gotten better and better and better and better. And he's done all the things you need to do as a performer to improve. And he has done that. And he's kind he's won me over now at the time. I wasn't a big Channing Tatum fan, but I'm a huge Jamie Foxx fan. And so I was really excited about the movie and the action. So it was so bad that I didn't even bother going to watch Olympus has fallen. And I was just one night when I was at home and like some plans had fallen through and Olympus has fallen was on VOD. So I thought, okay, I'll finally give this a shot. And I really liked Olympus has fallen. Like it's Gerard yeah, it's Butler great. running and it's got Aaron Eckhart in it and Morgan Freeman and all that kind of stuff. So, and it's Gerard Butler just running around killing a lot of terrorists in a lot of creative ways. I mean, that's, that's all it is. It doesn't pretend to be anything that's not. And I got to tell you, London has fallen. While the story is pretty stupid and it's got some massive plot holes, like no denying the plot holes, it yeah, is a major suspension of disbelief, I think. <laughs> oh my God, yes. But much like the first Olympus has fallen to me, it's Gerard, at the core of it, it's Gerard Butler running around killing a lot of terrorists in a lot of creative ways. I mean, ultimately, that's what the movie is. It makes, it has no pretense about be, making some grand political statement, it has no pretense of being a great you know, motion picture. It makes no pretense about any of that kind of stuff. And on that level, I kind of enjoyed it. Now I saw it with two other people, including my buddy soul. Um, who's like the CFO of the fine brothers and stuff like that. I went to go see it with him and he, he thought it was one of the worst motion pictures he'd ever seen. I kind (laughs) of liked it though. So anyway, London has fallen, comes in and makes $21 million on its opening weekend. So, and I think that's, I think they need to be happy with that. I think 21 million is not bad. Deadpool, Finally, in its fourth week, gets knocked out of the number one spot. It goes down to number three, making another $16 million. Deadpool's made over $650 million worldwide and over $300 million domestically. I don't know which... Were you surprised? Are you surprised by that? Yes. Oh, my God, yes. Like, totally <laughs> shocked. Like, like, look, even Fox, nobody at Fox, nobody at Fox thought this movie was going to break $200 million domestically. Like there's no way they just didn't. And that's why their budget on it, like their official budget is listed at $58 million in an era when comic book films are being made for like 170, 150, $200 million, an R rated Deadpool, you know, they figured it's not going to make that much. So let's make it, let's modest up the budget, $58 million budget. They, so I don't know what virgin they sacrificed to whichever (laughs) God it is. They worship over at Fox, but they crush it. Did you have a chance to see Deadpool? Listen, I swear to you, I love movies. I've just been so incredibly busy. I haven't had time to breathe. So I've got like a backlist of things that I need to see. But Deadpool is not one of them that I was like, I have to be honest. I wasn't super excited. Like the London is falling, Zootopia, I really wanted to see. Deadpool, I was like, meh. I I kind of felt meh. I like, I was sort of underwhelmed by the previews. And so- I, I'm equally surprised that it made that much money. Yeah, I, I think so. I think a lot of people are shocked by that. Uh, at number four was Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, which is really nice for me to see. Um, it's because I'm a big Tina Fey fan, so it makes 7.6. And at number five is Gods of Egypt, making $5 million, $22 million in total. So there's your top five. But really, the big story here is Zootopia and and doing so well. Like I, like I, I, I could have told you Zootopia was going to be number one at the box office this weekend. I could have told you that. But yeah, in no way, shape, or form did I foresee it making seventy-three 
million dollars. She says, the marketing to me has not been that good. Like you've seen the marketing, the ads, has it like, have you found it appealing? Have you found it enticing at all? Well, I found it enticing because it's the same director as Tangled and I loved Tangled. Me like, too. Watched Me it too. multiple times. I just, I loved it. I mean, yeah, I'm a girl and it's a very great, but it was one of those films, those animated films that reminded me of my, like my childhood animated films like the really good stuff like the little mermaid and beauty and the beast and those classics there was something about it that was just so well done in the direction and and just everything about it so when i realized it was the same director i was like huh okay I, you know I, I guess i expected it to do pretty well i'm really excited to see it though you know it's it's kind of a, a trend with this director because tangled was kind of the same thing for me whereas i thought it looked okay and was really, really pleasantly surprised by how good the movie ended up being, uh, like kind of shocked by it, as a matter of fact. So mm. he's two for two. All right, let's get on to the next topic here. <laughs> this right. one has got me scratching my head like nobody's business. Okay, so everybody remembers back in 2014, back when the Sony leaks happened and, you know, like a thousand That's different right. stories came out of there. But one of the interesting little nuggets that all of us, including myself, wrote off immediately in these Sony hacks was some emails about, I believe a couple of them included Jonah Hill, that Sony and Jonah Hill, that they were talking about in this age where everything has to be a shared cinematic universe. They were actually talking about doing a movie crossing over the 21 Jump Street franchise with the Men in Black franchise, <laughs> which all of us, I'm telling you, all of us, went, what the hell are they talking about? That was a stupid idea. Of course, this one went nowhere. Well, fast forward now to 2016. Variety is reporting. Like not some little cheap ass cosmic book movie news or movie pilot or whatever. Variety is reporting that, um, <laughs> yeah, not only was that real, we all knew it was real, but we just never think it was thought it was going to go anywhere. Not only was it real, it's happening, folks. According to Variety, <laughs> the wheels are in motion that they are dead serious about doing a 23 Jump Street and Men in Black crossover. Now, look, I love 21 Jump Street. The theme of today's show is movies that I didn't think looked any good and I ended up loving them. 21 Jump Street was one of those ones. 21 Jump Street was a movie I said, oh my God, this looks pathetic. This looks sad. This looks whatever. Yeah. And I only went to go see it because it was a press screening. So I went to go see it as a press screening and they showed, and I, I, I started thinking, wait a minute, does Sony really believe in this film? Cause they showed us this press screening for it like three weeks in advance, which is earlier than normal. And they told us going into the screening, by the way, once you're done the screening, feel totally free to share your thoughts on social media. Cause normally for these press screenings, they, they put an embargo on your actions for a little while, but they said, no, right. no, no. When you come out of the movie, you tweet and share whatever your thoughts are. And I went, wait a minute, did, do they really believe in this movie? So I go into it. Clearly. <laughs> yeah. So I go in, laugh my ass off at this movie. Like love 21 Jump Street, love 22 Jump Street. I can't even decide which one I like even better. Um, I love them both. So understand, I love the 21 Jump Street franchise. I've got a soft spot in my heart for the Men in Black franchise. I mean, it's it's gone downhill after the first Men in Black, granted, but I still have really a, downhill. Oh yeah. 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 I'm not going to sugarcoat it, but I do still have a soft spot in my heart for that franchise. And if they were to announce a men in black four next week, I would be in line to see it. But I look, I thought 21 jump street was a stupid idea. So take this with this giant grain of salt, but this is one of the most monumentally stupid ideas I have ever heard <laughs> crossing 21 jump street franchise with the men in black franchise. I, I, it, it, Here's what it reeks to me of. And then I want to get your, your thoughts on this, Aaron. But to me, it reeks of a desperation. Look, Sony doesn't have um, comic book characters other than Spider-Man and, and, you know, the various yeah. characters that inhabit the Spider-Man's world. And now they're sharing Spider-Man with Marvel. So Sony doesn't get to play in this universe that DC does. DC and Warner Brothers have this huge cinematic universe of comic book realms they can do. Marvel clearly has this huge universe of shared universe of properties they can do. Fox 
has this huge X-Men, Deadpool, you know, this huge franchises that they can make shared cinematic universes out of. Universal is trying to get into the shared cinematic universe space with these monster movies, with, with the classic monster movies, with they're launching with uh, The Invisible Man and The Mummy with uh, Johnny Depp and Tom Cruise, mm. all that kind of stuff. And Sony wants to get into the shared cinematic universe. And to me, this just reeks of desperation of trying to create some shared cinematic universes. And it's stupid to me because while shared cinematic universes have their obvious advantages, not everything needs to be a shared freaking cinematic universe. The first Men in Black was great completely on its own without being in a shared cinematic universe. The first 21 Jump Street <laughs> right. and 22 Jump Street were great despite the fact that they were not in shared cinematic universe. To me, this does not seem like a fit. I mean, crossing, if you want to do a shared cinematic universe, it seems to me you take men in black and you find another sci-fi property that you have and do those with 21 jump street. You take 21 jump street and you take another comedy or buddy cop or whatever, because there's no shortage of those on Sony's roster and you cross over. This just seems really dumb. Now, granted, I, I as I've admitted, some of the best things started off as really dumb ideas. And maybe this will be one of those diamonds in the rough. Absolutely. Let's let's not write this off entirely because let's see what the idea has. All I'm saying is that my initial reaction to this, and I'm sure a lot of you guys, is this just, this seems like supreme stupidity, like really, really dumb. So anyway, Aaron, you had a chance to hear about this story. What do you think about the idea of Sony crossing over 21 Jump Street with uh, Men in Black? To me, it reeks of a bad peyote trip. I, I like seriously think <laughs> that some executive went into went to the Joshua Tree and got this idea and came back and was like, "Guys!" And it, this was the person in the room that everyone's like snickering afterwards, like, "Oh God, we can't. What are we? We can't tell him or her no." You know? I mean, like, really? Like, where did this come from? I'm totally on board with you. I think it it makes absolutely no sense. I do not understand why that. I almost thought it was a a joke i mean i was i was like is this like early april fools maybe like what's happening here um yeah it seems like a bad trip but at the same time you know we also have donald trump not to bring politics into anything yeah. but like anything can happen john <laughs> anything can happen <laughs> and you know it's, and that reminds me like it, once again because we were talking a little bit about uh channing tatum earlier you know i when 21 Jump Street came out not a big fan of channing tatum looking at what he's doing now he's he's he attached with Fox, you know, we were talking about their X-Men He's attached with Fox to be in their upcoming superhero film, Gambit, although that's been delayed and we'll see when that's going to happen. But I, I, you know, I'm disappointed in this for two reasons. One, because I think it's a stupid idea. But number two, because I'm just really, I was really just looking forward to 23 Jump Street proper. I was just looking yeah. forward to a 23 Jump Street with Jonah Hill, Channing Tatum, Ice Cube. I mean, the three of them together have a really great chemistry. And I was just really looking forward to having something nice for Christmas, but apparently it is not to be. All right, let's move on to the next topic. And speaking of Sony and shared cinematic universes and comic book films, a number of years ago, back when The Amazing Spider-Man 2 with Andrew Garfield, directed by Mark Webb, was coming out. And by the way, I loved the first Mark uh, Mark Webb, Andrew Garfield, The Amazing Spider-Man. I loved it. I really, I thought it was yeah. wonderful. I I enjoyed the second one. A lot of people hated the second one and I could totally see why they hated. Like, even though I enjoyed it, to me, it was a massive step down in quality. But just before that came it. out. Yeah, okay, great. I mean, I think some people did. Now, right before that second one came out, and it didn't do as well financially. I mean, it still made them a lot of money, but it didn't do as well financially as they were hoping. It didn't get the audience response or the critic response that they were hoping for. Word came out that they were going to do a Venom standalone movie. Not only Venom, but they were talking about doing Sinister Six movies. They were thinking about taking all the characters associated with Spider-Man and creating a shared cinematic universe of Spider-Man films. And it, mm. it was very interesting. And a lot of people got excited at the name of Venom because Venom is a dude and a character that the audience gets very, very excited. He's a very visceral character, a very violent, very, you know, you'd, you'd be thinking maybe if Sony was going to do an R-rated comic book movie, Venom is the movie you could do. They brought on yeah. a writer and a director. Now, once The Amazing Spider-Man 2 hit its critical and audience 
you know, responses that they got and it didn't do as well financially as they're hoping for. But once again, cannot be stressed enough. They still made money. The movie made money. Because a lot of people, there's this there's this weird urban myth out there about The Amazing Spider-Man 2 that Sony lost tons of money on it and it was a big bomb. Completely no, false. No, that's not true. No, not yeah. true at all. It made, it made a lot of money, but not as much money as it should have made and that they were hoping. But once that all came about, they you stopped hearing reports about this shared Spider-Man universe. And then not too long after that, we heard about the deal to reboot Spider-Man again and bring Spider-Man into the Marvel Cinematic Universe with the Avengers and things like that. So Venom has gone been gone away ever since. But now there's an interesting story that's come out in The Hollywood Reporter that says that Sony is dead serious about launching a Venom movie. But here's the interesting thing. According to this story in The Hollywood Reporter, and I'm going to be really interested to keep my eye on this over the coming days to see what else comes out about this. But not only is Sony looking at doing a Venom movie and they're putting this back on the radar, but that the Venom movie will not be connected to Spider-Man. That this Venom huh. movie will not share the Spider-Man quote-unquote cinematic universe, which Spider-Man is now sharing with Marvel's The Avengers all at the same time. And to me, that is kind of odd. Anyway, you heard this. What did you think about this? I'm really excited by it. I mean, obviously I'm excited by any comic book character coming to life and particularly the sinister ones. You know, I don't know why. Maybe yeah. I'm, it's because I'm from New York City. <laughs> I, I like the darkness. Um, but kidding aside, no, no, I really, I was actually really excited when you sent me this link. That was the first that I heard of it. Um, but yeah, I think that that's a really weird choice, right? I mean, do you have any sense as to why they would do that? It doesn't it doesn't make sense. Why would you separate it? I, I'm not really sure because to me, like Venom is a lot like, I mean, to some people, it depends on who you ask in the comic book world. To some people, the Goblin, a Green Goblin is the quintessential Spider-Man villain. To some people, it's a Doc Ock. But I think, you know, since the, oh, when did, I think it was like 1984 is when Venom was introduced. To me, yep. since like 84, 85, 86 in the early 90s, to me, Venom has become the quintessential Spider-Man antagonist. And, you know, Venom Venom has done a lot of weird things in his run. I mean, he's even been in the Guardians of the Galaxy in the comic books. I mean, Venom has been one of the Guardians of the Galaxy for a while. He joined the, you know, he joined that team for a while. So he's gone through a lot of various transformations. Right. But I think if you talk to a lot of people today... When you think Spider-Man villain, a lot of people will say Venom. And the idea, so to me, this is like having a Dr. Moriarty movie without having any Sherlock Holmes. You know, it- Yeah, that's a real, that's actually a great analogy. That's yeah, a great it just, analogy. it doesn't yeah. seem to fit with me. Like why, how, first of all, how do you get away from the fact that the dude looks like Spider-Man? I mean, so how- right. I'll how do you right. do that? Also, he's called Venom, right? So, I mean, it's, I mean, just by name alone, you're associating it with some sort of insect or snake or something. I mean, it's not like it's totally separate. And by the way, Venom appeared as a character in Spider-Man 3. So it's not yes, like- in the Sam Raimi this version. never happened. Which they yes. played by yeah, Topher by Grace and that everybody detested and hated. I mean, that that was right. a horrible, horrible movie, granted. And, and But ever since that Spider-Man, I'm glad you brought up that one because ever since that Spider-Man 3, people have been really, what it did was- it didn't turn people off Venom. What it did was it made a lot of people, a lot of movie fans yearn to see a proper, um, you know, uh, incarnation of Venom on the big screen. But I, to me, it's just very odd. Now, the only thing that I'm speculating here, believe me, this is pure speculation. I haven't heard this from anywhere. This is just me guessing. All right. Is that Sony knows that a Venom movie could be successful and a Venom movie could do well and that people are interested in Venom. But something tells me that Marvel, because remember, Sony Sony still owns Spider-Man, but they have this deal now with Marvel where Marvel gets to put some of their characters in the Sony movies and Sony gets to put Spider-Man in the Avengers movies. I am just wondering here if for whatever reason, Marvel isn't interested in Venom being part of the lexicon of this new Spider-Man. And therefore, Sony goes, well, okay, then, then we're just going to make a standalone Venom movie sans Spider-Man. Um, and if that's the but case. But even that doesn't, that doesn't explain it, right? Like why? It's yeah. Still, I don't know. It's just, it's just Sorry. really strange to me. <laughs> no, I mean, you're right. That Even that doesn't really fully explain it. 
it just seems like a very, very odd thing. I mean, like it, it's kind of reminiscent of Warner brothers has announced that they're going to have a Shazam movie. And two years ago, they announced the rock was going to play Shazam's main antagonist, black Adam. But here it is two years later and we still don't know who's going to play Shazam. I mean, but you can't separate Shazam and black Adam. I mean, that's, they're the yin and the yang to each other. It's like separating right. Batman from the Joker or Superman from Lex Luthor. Right. I mean, you just, you don't do a standalone Lex Luthor movie with no Superman. It just, it just feels odd to me. So, I'm going to be interested in seeing how this whole thing shakes out. All right. Hopefully it's beyond, it's beyond just bureaucratic red tape. I really hope that that's not the reason. <laughs> I that just know, be right? Cause that's right now I'm telling you, that's the only thing I can conceive of why Sony would want to do. Like, I can't imagine a scenario in which Sony just on their own volition just goes, Hey, let's just do a Venom movie without Spider-Man. It like, and remember, we're not talking about, it's okay to do, say, a Joker movie that doesn't have Batman, but you you would know, let's say DC decides to do a Joker movie with Jared Leto as a standalone movie and not have Batman in that movie. That's fine as right. long as you acknowledge that, hey, Batman, though, is in this world and Batman is a part of his reality. It, what strikes me as odd is that reading this report in The Hollywood Reporter, it just sounds like, and maybe they're just reporting it wrong. Maybe they're just not wording it right. Or maybe I'm just misunderstanding what they're writing. But to me, it seems like we're going to do a Venom movie. Not only will it be a standalone movie, it's going to have nothing to do with Spider-Man. That seems really odd. It just seems really odd. It does. It doesn't even make sense from a marketing perspective. If you looked at it from a business angle, Oh, you know? absolutely. why would you? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Let's move on to the next topic here. And this next one, okay. uh, going back to the idea of remakes, according to a report in deadline, now this is, but they've talked about a Death Wish rebooting for a long time. For those of you who don't know, who may be too young, Death Wish is like, uh, it might even be before I was born. But Death Wish, the original novel, like was out in like 1972, and the original Death Wish film came out in 1974, starred the immortal Charles Bronson as an average man who's just fed up and becomes this vigilante uh, and starts killing bad guys. And it's called Death. And they went on to make like, I think, 35 Death, Death Wish movies. I can't remember how many they did, but they did a lot. So they're talking about remaking it now. There's been talk about um, a, a Death Wish remake. Actually, Joe Carnahan, who directed The Grey and a bunch of other films, was was attached for a while to direct it, but then that kind of fell apart. But now Deadline is saying that the green light has been given again that things are in motion again for a Death Wish remake with Bruce Willis attached to star in the iconic Charles Bronson role. So I ask you, Aaron, would you be cool with the idea of a Death Wish remake with Bruce Willis playing the Charles Bronson character? First of all, I'm pulling the age card here, John, because I didn't even know what Death Wish was. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, definitely before my time, but I, to be quite honest, I really just, I didn't even know about this until you sent it to me. Um, Bruce Willis, you know, I have mixed feelings on him. I mean, is this going to be a comedy? Because oh, I doubt the, it. the original was right. Exactly. So if the original was sort of comedic, then maybe, um, I don't, I honestly have to see it in order to have, have you seen the original? I have, I saw the, I first saw the originals about, Oh gosh, I think like 15 years ago, I sat down and watched all the originals. And well, yeah, look, you, some of them are really bad, but the original one is like classic, like total classic. Okay. All right. So then he's got, so then that means that the bar is set pretty high, right? Because that's yes. always the thing. It's like, you can't just attach a big name and hope that the remake is going to be great. Obviously we've seen that fail time and time again. So when I think Bruce Willis, I don't know, my personal default uh, mode is to think, okay, even if he's playing a badass, there's got to be some sort of humor here. I can't take him seriously. I don't know why. Bruce, if you're listening, I'm really sorry. No, but, but that <laughs> is what he's done in the last number of years. Like whether you're talking about the Die Hard franchise or even, by the way, uh, uh, R.E.D., Red. I loved Red. Um, I thought he yes, was Yes, that great. was great. I thought he was wonderful. At that. Yeah. But even in that, he's been action slash comedy. And Death Wish is not action slash comedy. As a matter of fact, you could make an argument that act Death Wish isn't even action an action film per se there there's some action in it absolutely mm -hmm. but it's really a character study of a of an average man who's pushed too far um and so bruce willis i mean 
Here's my problem with it. I think Bruce Willis is a fine actor and I'm a big fan of Bruce Willis. I, I enjoy his movies when they're not garbage and he's yeah. made a lot of great yeah. movies, <laughs> but it just seems like the safe casting choice. Oh, we need an older guy in an action kind of role, Bruce exactly. Willis. And it's exactly. like, couldn't, I would have been more interested. I don't know. Although he's too old for it. I would have been more interested in like yeah, a Michael Caine. Like either a Michael Caine. Ooh, Michael Caine. Yeah, like who yeah. is this big I English badass? Like forget forget Alfred, ladies and gentlemen. He is a big English badass, Michael Caine. I don't care how old he is. <laughs> but something like him. No, I love him. He's yeah. Yeah. Him or like another actor I really think is underrated by the name of David Morse. I think a David Morse would have been cool. I think yes. it's a lot of different days. So look, it all depends on what their take on this is. If they do, do decide to just go gritty and dark and make it character driven and Bruce Willis is on board to play that, that could be really interesting. But I'm like you, Aaron, in the sense that if it's, if this is a warning sign that this new death wish is going to be action comedy, then I'm going to be disappointed. Uh, I will be. And because I'm cool, I'm cool with remakes. I'm all for remakes because if they turn out crappy, who cares? We still have the originals. But so I think there's, I think there's merit in doing a, a Death Wish remake because like you said, like, and you're not, you're not a 19 year old. You haven't even seen Death Wish. I think a lot of people today haven't seen Death Wish. So I think it's prime for a good remake. I just hope they remake it. Look, don't make it a shot for shot replica of the first one, but at least stay true to the spirit of it, you know, and turning death wish into right. a paint by numbers action comedy. I, like I said, to me would just be kind of disappointing. All right. I mean, Hey, listen, maybe, maybe Bruce is uh, going in a new direction. Maybe it's the Ben Affleck to Batman. <laughs> he is to death. Don't, let's not get started on that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bring that up. I'm sorry. Let's, Go to the other topic. I'm sure we'll have lots of opportunities over the course of doing this show that we will have to talk about Batman versus Superman for, and Ben Affleck as, as Batman. Um, and for me to complain. Okay, and, yes. <laughs> see, oh, you're one of those people. I love the Ben Affleck <laughs> casting as Batman, but we'll get into that another time. Oh, God. Okay, John. All right, speaking <laughs> of action films, let's move on to this one. According to uh, an interview done over with IGN, apparently... About a year or so ago, there was talk about Tomb Raider coming back and being rebooted, staying on the on the topic of reboots here. Now, uh, about a year and a half ago, the Tomb Raider game franchise was rebooted to huge success. People loved the game and they loved the narrative of the game. And uh, a lot of people really liked it. It was a little bit of a different Laura Croft than what we've traditionally seen. But anyway, so then immediately there were some talks and even an announcement that the studio is now looking at doing a Tomb Raider reboot. However, that was a while ago and everything's kind of been caught in the mud. That being said, the director of the new Tomb Raider movie, which has not yet been greenlight or, or fully put in motion, but they have hired a director by the name of Roar Uthog, and I'm positive I mispronounce his name. He sounds like uh, the lead singer of a Norwegian death metal band, but um, That's right. <laughs> Roar Uthog, he was recently interviewed and talked about what kind of Laura Croft they would have. And he said this, he said, I think making Laura Croft feel like a real human being, that's definitely something we want to bring to the big screen as well. I think we'll want to make people relate to Laura as a character. I'm hoping to bring some of my Norwegian sensibilities to the franchise. I've always been a fan of strong female characters, and I've had strong female characters in all my previous movies, so that's something I thought was interesting. So Aaron, you're hearing him, the director talk about, what do you think about what he wants to bring in a new iteration of Laura Croft to a Tomb Raider remake? Well, listen, man, as a strong female character myself in a real life, <laughs> <laughs> I like what Roar is, I'm picking up what Roar is putting down. Uh, by the way, the way that his name is spelled, it looks like he's a character out of Thor, which is one of my yes, favorites. So yes. we'll talk about that too. Um, but but all kidding aside, I think that's great. I, I mean, I'm all for it. I think, listen, there's been tons of conversation about women in Hollywood and women needing to have real meaty roles that aren't, and by, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with, you know, uh, looking the way that Lara Croft looks and also being a badass too. So I think if he can marry those two things, he'll make not only the guy viewers happy, but the female viewers happy too, because we want to see a character that's, you know, who I, who I really love like Jessica Jones, the Netflix um, right. uh, series. Like she's just this like strong, tough chick. So I feel like if he can do that and he can bring some of his uh, Viking, 
Viking sensibilities to it. I'll be very happy. <laughs> Some Norwegian Viking sensibilities. Um, look, <laughs> I here's the thing. I've talked uh, for a long time about how we need more strong female protagonists in our films. Like, and I think when you look at films, whether it's like, even if you go something that on the surface, look, Hit Hit Girl was, I don't care that the movie was called Kick-Ass, Hit Girl was the centerpiece of Kick-Ass. I mean, we all know it. Everybody yeah. knows it. Whether you're talking about something like the Hunger Games franchise or things like that, or, or the Aliens franchise or whatever, strong female protagonists can work and work really well if you give them good movies and good vehicles to, to do and to be. I think that's important. And so I, on that level, I'm kind of excited about a new Tomb Raider. However, let me say this. Um, okay. When the director says, I'm thinking about making Laura Croft feel like a real human being. I don't know that I'm all into that. I'll, I'll be honest with you because think about it in, in some male counterpart terms, right? John McClane, going back to Bruce Willis in his Die Hard movies, the character John McClane, okay. there's nothing that feels like a real human being there. He is at John McClane in the Die Hard, one of the greatest action characters of all time. To me, feels nothing like a real human being. He feels like like yeah. a very much a caricature and a model of an action film character. But guess what? He's awesome. One of the greatest action characters of all time. And I think. Like, there are a lot of female characters. Like, for instance, you're talking about uh, where they're talking about Katniss in Hunger Games. That character feels very much like a very human character. Uh, and it works mm. there. It works in that thing, in that context. Um, Ripley, actually, they they went out of the way to make Ripley feel very human in the midst of all the actions going on. And that worked for Ripley. But I've always seen Laura Croft, this is just me personally, more like a John McClane character. I just see her seeing her being a character of a female icon action hero character. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not like John McClane. I'm not all that interested in seeing us change the pathos of Laura Croft all that much and making her more human. Let's go more into her difficult emotional development growing up. I like, I, I'm just, I, I don't care about the John McClane. <laughs> I don't care about that in, in, in several of my action heroes. Look, and I'm not saying there's not room for that with action heroes, be they male or female. There obviously is, and there's lots of great examples of them. But like I said, just for me personally, Laura Croft feels like falls in that category of a John McClane to me. I, I don't want to see the more human one. I just want to see this badass, strong, confident, kick-ass character, Laura Croft, who's an adventurer and almost defies reality, much like John McClane is in the Die Hard movie. So that's, eh, that's just me. Look, I, I'm just going to be happy to get a new Laura Croft movie one way or the other. I'm going to be happy to get it. But like I said, if I had my druthers, I would keep her as she is, which is just like a action machine. That's, that's if just it me. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Now, um, now you could make an argument that the Tomb Raider franchise is a little bit broke after, you know, right. <laughs> the, after the last couple of ones, but I don't know. I, th I think it can work. Well, uh, he said he, interestingly in that quote though, he, he said, I think we'll want to make people relate to Laura as a character. I want, so I wonder what he means about making her feel like a real human being. I'm totally on board with you, by the way, if it's going to be about like exploring her emotionally damaging childhood, I'm really like that will not fit. And I, I'm not interested in that, but if it's going to be exposing her fallibility and some other um, creative way, then that could be interesting. I don't know how it's going to play out, though. No, me neither. All right, let's get on to the uh, last major topic of the day. Speaking of Batman versus Superman that we mentioned earlier, director Zack Snyder was recently doing an interview with DC All Access, which, by the way, my friend uh, Tiffany is one of the hosts of. Um, so he recently did an interview with DC All Access, and he talked about how there is simply no winning for Superman. Superman cannot win in this particular world um, that he now lives in. And this is what he said in this interview, which is really rather interesting. He said this, over the last two years, he, talking about Superman, over the last two years, he's basically been Superman as pop culture would know him. He's been righting wrongs. There have been floods, mines have collapsed, bridges have collapsed, churches have caught fire. He's basically been a hero. When we find him, he's been dealing with the everyday world of being a superhero. But there's a paradigm shift happening in that the unintended consequences of some of those rescues are starting to come into fruition. Uh, 
he's starting to see that every action has a reaction. Like if you just, if you're just taking a cat out of a tree, you can't touch anything. The Oboros will say, he's damaged that tree. Uh, he damaged that tree branch when he got the cat down or the cat wasn't neutered. So now there are thousands of cats. There's just <laughs> no winning for Superman. Um, I heard, uh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I heard these comments. Well, listen, let, let's go on to the second. I don't want to read too much, but this is the second part of his comments. He says this. He says, it's interesting to see how Batman perceives Superman because he doesn't know who Superman is. All he knows is the public face of Superman. And if you have an idea about someone or if you start to doubt someone's intentions, you can always read in the media. You can always see in the face that you what you want to see based on how it's reported. Batman has seen the destruction of Metropolis. That's the one thing he knows for a fact. So if thousands die, is that okay? What next? Millions? Is everyone okay with that? Because I'm not. That's Batman's point of view. So it's a really interesting, you know, kind of perception that he he brings that. What do you think of Zack Snyder's comments? Well, the first part, I'm thinking he obviously has visited Parks Slope Brooklyn or some other <laughs> bastion of uh, of protesting liberals. And by the way, I say that as a liberal. I just happen not to protest cats and trees or whatever. Um, but, I mean, listen, he makes a good point there in terms of like you've reached the end. Like how much more good can you actually do? And it's interesting from from a cultural perspective, too, um, to pit, pit those two positions uh, against each other. I think Batman obviously has a more interesting position here, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I need to mull that one over a little bit. What, what's your takeaway? Well, it's it's what he's talking about is so true in life. I mean, it really is. Yeah, that exactly. people look. We are far more intelligent and far more sophisticated and far more advanced of a people than we were a hundred years ago. Yes, but in many ways, we're still just a pack of fucking idiots. Because look, <laughs> there there are people out there who if they decide they don't like somebody, then no matter what that somebody does, they will find a way to spin that into a negative, right? So just look at, let's, sure. let's, let's go back to something that happened a few years ago. And I'm just pulling these names out of a hat. So like Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, right? So mm -hmm. they adopt one or maybe a couple, I can't remember off the top of my head. They adopt one or a couple of kids from like impoverished nations that didn't have a very positive outlook, you know, for their future and adopted those children right. and brought those children into their home to share their homes and their lives with, to give that child a life they never would have had otherwise. I'm sorry, no matter what you think of Brad Pitt or Angelina Jolie, and I'm sure there's lots of different opinions out there about those two people and that's fine, but I'm sorry, that was a good act. That was a yes. good act of humanity. That was something good that they did. But what do you get? You get a bunch of losers who don't do anything to benefit humanity to complain, well, why didn't they adopt American kids? Like, are you fucking serious? Are you being serious <laughs> right now? You, you want to find a way to complain and spin something that is objectively good that they did and try to make it seem like it was something bad. And that's true. You could see it play out yeah. in our political world. You know, if a politician that you don't yep. like does something good, you and your the people who follow your train of thought will find a way to spin that into something bad. That is what we as people do. So I think it's kind of interesting that Zack Snyder is bringing that, that part of human nature, to be honest into the Batman versus Superman universe. And I think it's going to make the Batman versus Superman movie all that more deep and all that more interesting to me because we're going to see that at place. Look, Superman, we all just take for granted, Superman is the quintessential good guy. He's the Boy Scout. He is the right. ultimate good guy. How on earth can Batman look at him as a bad guy? Well, because it's very easily explained how Batman could see him as a bad guy or as a threat. And I really like the fact that Zack Snyder is bringing you know, these kind of elements into the universe. And I think it'll help explain a lot because a lot of people who never read The Dark Knight Returns and who don't know the history of Batman and Superman, they just know the comic book characters, that they're two good guys, whatever. Uh, I've heard a lot of people ask the question, wait a minute, Batman versus Superman, why would Batman and Superman fight? They're both good guys. Ah, uh, yes, but it's not that simple, is it? 
And I think, no. yeah, I think no. it's going to be really fascinating. Like I am, look, I, I'm so excited for this movie. I can't even begin to tell you I'm chomping at the bit for the 24th. I, we, we can hear it in your voice. Yes. <laughs> we can hear it in your voice. I am too. And I, and if you want to get psychological about it, by the way, Superman is really sure. psychologically just a reflection of a complex that human beings, we as human beings have, right. That we think, especially men, by the way, that you can, you can have, you can have your cake and eat it too. You can save the world, right? Well, really there are con- consequences and you can't please everybody. So it's, it, it is very interesting. It, that's why I said it sort of re- reflects our, our current state of culture. So I think it was, it was a very interesting viewpoint that he took. Definitely. Um, all you. right, guys, one of the things we're going to do with, uh, with this show, every, uh, every episode is we're going to take some of your questions that you want to send in topics that you send into us via Twitter. And this is how you get a question to us. Simply get on Twitter and tweet out your question or the topic you'd like to raise using the hashtag TJCP, the, uh, the John Campia podcast. So hashtag TJCP, make sure you include that hashtag. That way we will get it and we will see it. And uh, we've picked out a bunch of questions. I got on my social media earlier today, asked you guys to send in some questions and hundreds of you sent in questions. Uh, so uh, Aaron, why don't you list off the questions we got? All right, so I'm going to try and get the uh, Twitter handles right, but if I don't, I apologize to whoever's listening. First one's from uh, Jay Ricardo 5 h He says, since CW is doing well with comic TV shows, will we see even more? And if we do, what character would you like to see, John? It's, it's interesting because, you know, I thought doing Arrow was a dumb idea, but I ended up liking Arrow for the first couple of seasons. Um... And even after I liked Arrow for the first couple of seasons, when they announced that they were doing The Flash, I thought, ah, oh, that's not going to work. But it worked great. I mm. love The Flash. Actually, The Flash is my my favorite comic book show on TV right now. And there's, I mean, a few really? years ago, there'd be like one or two, but now there's like 10 comic book shows on TV. And it's <laughs> my favorite right now. And then they announced Legends of Tomorrow, which is kind of like that that same Arrow-Flash shared universe with, with secondary characters from Arrow and Flash making up this new team called the Legends of Tomorrow. And I did not like the idea. And I'm going to tell you right now, I, I haven't loved Legends of Tomorrow yet, but it's not as completely unwatchable as I initially thought it would be. Um, like I said, I don't love the show, but it's just been intriguing enough to keep me coming back for the next episode. You know what I mean? So, yeah. but they are having success with it. So I think, yes, if you're asking the question, you know, will we see even more of them do, do this? Yes. I, I think we will, especially if legends of tomorrow ends up being successful and we're going to have to give it till the end of its first season to really know if it's successful or not. But if it is, I can see them doing more as to now, which character would I like to see? I, I honestly don't care because it almost doesn't matter what character they use. It all depends on how they use the character because you know, the Green Arrow exactly. in the TV show Arrow is not really the comic book version of Green Arrow. This Barry Allen is not really, they've taken a lot of liberties with this Barry Allen. So it's kind of a different character. They've just made good shows. Now, I I got fed up with Arrow after season three and I ditched the show, but still they made a couple of seasons of great TV. I love the star of the sh- series, uh, Stephen Amell. I still think he's great. Um, they got Grant Gustin mm. playing Barry Allen in The Flash, and he does a fantastic job. They got some really cool actors playing some really interesting characters in Legends of Tomorrow, even though I'm not totally on board with that show yet, but we're going to keep giving it a chance to see where it goes. So I don't really have a character I'd like to see. I'm just more interested in seeing what they do with whatever character they get. So will they do more? I think so. If Legends of Tomorrow gets a second season, I think you can guarantee they're going to do more. And as far as which character, don't really care. It's really more about how I think they're going to use them. I agree with you on that. I, and I'm also jaded and I think everything is a business decision at the end of the day that they, that's, it's like, I mean, listen, if it's making the money now, which it's currently a trend and it's working, then it's just going to continue to be pumped out. So at some point it's going to taper off. Maybe, but they've been that's saying that, that about right, comic book question. movies. They've been, saying, from, they've been saying it's going to taper off about comic book movies for the past 10 years. And it's so we'll, okay, we'll, fair enough. we'll see, we'll see. I hope it doesn't anytime soon because I enjoy that stuff. So um, this uh, next question is from the John T. Uh, he says, is the Venom movie announcement a product of the of the Deadpool success after both studios originally handling each character so poorly? I don't think so. I mean, look, a lot of people were like, I talked about this uh, on one of my final episodes of Movie Talk, but 
a lot of people will point to Deadpool and say, see, R-rated comic book movies can work. But you got to remember, there were a lot of R-rated comic book movies um, that have come out, like at, at least 10 or 11 or 12 that we could probably name off. There were lots of R-rated comic book movies. And except for one of those 12, which uh, uh, 300, they all failed. Like they all failed. Mm. Deadpool was a perfect storm of different situations. Yes, it was rated R, but they also made an incredibly hilarious movie. Their marketing was really more marketed on the comedy of the movie than it was on anything else. It was really more marketed yeah. as an action comedy than it was marketed as a comic book movie, to be honest. It sure. was really marketed as an action comedy. And so you had this character who could break the fourth wall and do all these ridiculous comedic things with the fact that they had a great script that was incredibly funny, incredibly entertaining, that you then spun off this incredible marketing campaign, which might be the greatest marketing campaign of any movie in history. Those The marketing was hilarious and entertaining all by itself. Mm. Venom is a totally different situation. Venom, yeah, you can make him R, but th therein lies the end of the similarities between Deadpool and Venom. Venom would not be a hilarious comedy that you could build this great viral, funny, engaging marketing campaign around. Like, no, it's, it's a, oh, no way. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it would be a totally different ball of wax and it's going to appeal to a totally different type of viewer. Like, because you know, Deadpool. Yeah. My mom's never heard of Deadpool, but that marketing, because it's funny and fun, it appealed to my mom and my mom wanted to go see it. You're not going to be able to say the same thing about Venom. So yeah, no. it's going to be dark. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be dark. I think it has more to do with the fact that Sony really loves this character Venom. We talked about a little bit earlier that I think they want to do a Venom, even if they have to do it without, without Spider-Man. I really don't think the success of Deadpool has much to do with it. I, I really don't because these are two radically different situations with two radically different types of characters that will ultimately end up being two radically different movies. So I just don't see enough similarities between them. All right. Next question is from Sean Wren. This is my favorite question, by the way, because <laughs> <laughs> I actually have it too. And also they're filming the movie two blocks from my house. Uh, he says, do you think the Baywatch movie has come at the perfect time for Zac Efron to help stop his recent run of poor films? <laughs> yeah. Zac Efron has, has put out a couple stinkers that we are your friends was horrible, but oh like, look, God. let's not forget. It was just last year. The neighbors came out. And Neighbors was wonderful. I, I love Neighbors. I thought it was really fun and funny. Um, there's another one that he did with Miles Teller and, oh, Creed, Michael B. Jordan. The, uh, called, I think it's called That Awkward Moment. Now, a lot of people didn't like That Awkward Moment. And I was late to the game on that one. So I actually watched, I didn't see that one in theater. And... I actually quite enjoyed it. I thought it was, now, was it a great movie? No, but I thought that there was good character chemistry. I thought the pace of the film was good. I thought it had a nice feel and a nice tone and it was funny and I, I enjoyed it. Um, so I think he's doing okay with some bad ones mixed in. And yeah, that one he just did with Robert De Niro, that one looked really funny. I think, what was it? Dirty Grandpa or something that he just did. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I've tuned him out at this yeah, point. Yeah, turned turn out to be horrible. I think Zac Efron is a really gifted actor. I think Baywatch and I think... Um, neighbors two are going to readjust the public perception of Zac Efron again, because I think both of these movies are going to be really funny. Cause I, I love the first neighbors. I think doing Baywatch with the rock, I think that's going to do a lot for him. I can already can see come the, some of the comedy coming in uh, to it and what style of comedy they're going to have. So I, I don't think Zac Efron has had a long, I think he's had two. I think he had two bad films in a row, but I don't think it's a long run of bad films. Um, but I do think that these next two are going to readjust the public perception of him at this point. What, like what you're not, you don't sound like you're all that enthralled with Zac Efron. Oh no. Listen, as someone in the electronic dance music world, like the actual world, not the fake crappy one that they represented so horribly in that movie, I will never forgive him after that film. I just can't like, <laughs> how could you, how could you have, I don't care how, how much convincing your agent did or who you owed a favor to. How could you pick up that script and say, you know what? I think this would be a good thing to do. Like it's, a, it's like you're, you're hurting humanity with the creation of something like that. I'm sorry. I just like, I, I will never forgive him. You know, I'm sorry, Zach. It's so interesting to hear your point of view as a DJ yourself and as, as a, a contributing editor over at DJ Magazine. It's interesting to hear your perception on that because my perception was initially, 
wow, they messed this up because although this will appeal to people in the EDM community and in that lifestyle, it's not going to appeal to oh, anybody no. else. But now hearing from you, it didn't appeal to that community either at all. I can't, I don't even have an analogy for another community because it was like that awful. I like, and, and then I get so incensed when I think about it that I can't think straight. So I'll come back to you in the future with another analogy. So you can be like, oh yeah, now I see what you're saying. But it was just, it, it's just so absolutely atrocious on every level. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know what he was. Maybe he was at that peyote um, uh, powwow <laughs> at the Joshua tree. <laughs> With the Sony reps. Yes. Exactly. That's what's now. Now it's all coming. It's all makes phone. sense now. All right. What's next? <laughs> all right. Uh, next is a uh, tweets by Vicus. Vicus. Uh, he says, uh, or she actually, I don't know if it's he or she says, if you're doing uh, hashtag TJCP, which is this podcast, then why did you leave Collider Video in the first place? We miss you on Collider Video. Oh, uh, thanks so much. Yeah, it's it's funny. A lot of people have been tweeting me that because I made the announcement on my social media that I was going to be launching this podcast. And it was going to be mostly talking about movies because that's what I do. And some people have been asking me, like, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you're doing that, why did you, why did you, why did you just leave Collider Video to just do the same thing? Why didn't you just stay with Collider Video? And something I, I realize not everybody follows me on social media, but you totally should, by the way. Um, I know not <laughs> everybody. Plug. Yeah. <laughs> fun plug. Um, I know not everybody follows me on social media. So look, here's the thing. And I mentioned this on my Facebook page. Um, the difference between, for instance, movie talk, which was the show I created and ran for like almost five years. Um, and doing this podcast are night and day. Doing an episode, one episode of movie talk was literally six to eight hours of my day by itself. That's not counting the other 13 shows we did. So now, whereas this is a podcast that literally is probably about an hour and a half of effort for me, like maybe about 20 minutes of prep time, 50 minutes of doing the show, 10, 15 minutes of editing, boom, done. And there I'm done. It's done. And yeah. we can record it anytime we want. I get to do it from home and I'm not even going to tell you guys if I'm wearing pants or not right now because, <laughs> because it doesn't matter. I mean, that's the or great me. thing. Or you. And guess what? Aaron's at home. I'm at home. I didn't have to travel to a studio. I didn't have to get ready. I didn't have to do all these other things. And you know, it, it's also important that this is an audio only show. This isn't a video show. So that takes a world of work out of it. So like the reason I left um, Collider, because I'd been doing that show for a long time. I'd been doing movie talk for years and years and years, it, you know, including all the little buildup to it, to, to bring it to where it was today was the fact that over the past few years, I've had a number of opportunities presented to me and I've had to turn them down because I just didn't have the time because running movie talk and running Collider video. And before that AMC movie news was all encompassing. Now, I want to make it clear, and I said this on my on my Facebook page, this podcast is something that Aaron and I are doing for fun. This isn't my new gig. Like, so, if, so if anybody's out there is under the impression that I left Collider Video so I could do this podcast, no, 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 no. This is, a, this is something we're doing for fun. I mean, this is just for great. I've been talking about movies long before I ever went to AMC. I'm going to be talking about movies long after. I do have new things coming up that are going to be my new gigs. I just can't announce what those are yet. I can announce they will be coming soon. And trust me, it's big, but, um, that's not what this is. I did not leave Collider to come here. That's, that's not what I did. This is totally separate. This is fun. This is about me just having an ache and a desire and a love for talking about movies. And that's why I want to start this podcast because it's a low effort, low time requirement, low resource requirement way for me to talk about movies. And I was, and I thought I was gonna have to do it by myself. And, you know, I was lucky enough to find out Aaron had interest in doing it as well. And, and we're doing this for fun. This isn't, you know, replacing her DJ mag gig. This isn't replacing Clyder video for me. This is just something that we're doing for fun because we get to do it. And it's pretty easy to do. But I don't want to speak for you, Aaron. Why are you here? What are you doing this for? <laughs> well, because I like working without my pants on, John, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Which could be any number of professions on Hollywood Boulevard. It no, absolutely um... could, yes. <laughs> I mean, literally, actually, any number of professions. No, just the same thing as you, man. It's it's super exciting, right? It's different than just talking about music all the time. And I, I work for a biotech company as well, and I studied genetics uh, through Stanford University. So the idea of talking about mutants, like X-Men is my favorite thing ever. <laughs> so literally, the, I, I literally study gene mutations, right? So like actually knowing the science and then being like, but 
that there's truth in fiction is just like so delightful to me. So to get to just chat about this stuff, man, is awesome. Um, I love All it. All right. All right. What's the last, I guess this is our last question of the day. La last question. And then I actually, I forgot I wanted to talk about the gay agenda, but we'll, we'll, oh. we'll ask this question. Um, I guess we're going to talk about the gay agenda. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's gonna be good. Um, all right, this last one is from Alex B R T N four eight two. Wherever you are, he says, uh, "Can Suicide Squad beat the August opening weekend record of ninety four million three hundred twenty thousand eight hundred eighty three dollars currently being held by Guardians of the Galaxy?" Um, okay, there's. I'm going to say probably not, but there's a giant if. There's a huge if attached to that. It all is going to depend on Batman versus Superman. It's all mm. going to depend on Batman versus Superman that comes out in three weeks. Because if Batman versus Superman comes out and people love it, and it's awesome, like they give, they get the same reaction that Avengers gets, or they get the same reaction that Deadpool gets. If, if Batman v Superman comes out and people love it, and it makes a billion dollars worldwide, then yes then yes, it can. I'm not going to say it will. It's a little bit of a harder sell than Batman v Superman because, you know, my mother, I, I use my mother as my as my tent of truth all the time. <laughs> my mother knows Batman and Superman. My mother does not know Deadshot. My mother does not know Enchantress. My mother does not know Harley Quinn. Um, she's not, or Killer Croc or any of the, she's not really, she wouldn't be interested in going to see that. And that's going to be the big difference because to make a $100 million opening weekend, which is what you're talking about to make a hundred million dollars yeah. opening weekend means you have to have broad appeal to people outside of just the comic book movie fans. You know, they've done that with Avengers. You know, people who've never read a comic book in their lives go to the Avengers movies because they love it. Um, sure. Can, um, de uh, I can say dead squad. Can the suicide <laughs> squad have that kind of appeal? Right now, it doesn't look like it, but we've still got a ways to go. So we haven't seen the totality of Warner, Warner Brothers' uh, marketing campaign and what their strategy is going to be, but their trailers have been good. Um, I think, look, I think Suicide Squad is going to be success. And I hope that people don't think that, oh my gosh, if it doesn't bre break um, Guardians of the Galaxy opening weekend record, that means it's a failure. No, 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 no. Look, if Suicide Squad opens up to like $70 million, that's good. And it should not be looked at as anything else other than really good if it makes $70 million. Can it get to 100? Maybe, but it would depend on Batman v Superman being not just a big box office success, but a critical and fan reaction success as well. What do you think, Aaron? Uh, I say basically, no pressure, Ben Affleck. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no pressure, Ben, but the entire franchise, the entire future of the Warner Brothers cinematic universe with the DC comics rests on yeah. Ben Affleck's shoulders. And just saying <laughs> they're the right shoulders to be on. But I'm sure you and I can get into that debate another time. Um, that's next. <laughs> that's 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 tomorrow. That's the next episode. But, you know, we've already gone over an hour. I wanted to talk about UFC 196. I want to talk about some other things, but we have kind of we should probably cut it at this one here. So uh, trust me, I will get around to talk about uh uh, the UFC man, Conor McGregor loses Misha Tate shocks the world and beats Holly home. I want to talk about that a little bit, but, uh, we are going to be back again tomorrow. That is Tuesday. Um, and uh, talk more about this stuff. So do me a favor, guys, jump into the, uh, comments. If you're watching this video on my YouTube channel, and jump into the comments and let us know what you thought about this show. Give me your thoughts and your suggestions if this is something that you like. Uh, jump in. If you're listening to this on my Facebook post or on Aaron's Facebook or Twitter, whatever, leave us your thoughts. Let us know what you think. But really do me a big favor. Make sure it should be propagated by now. I think you should be able to find this uh, podcast now on iTunes. If not, you will be able to find it there in the next day or two because it's just propagating. But once it's up on iTunes, please do me a favor. If you like this podcast, Make sure you subscribe on iTunes. Even if you don't use iTunes, just subscribe anyway and leave a comment on iTunes uh, and a rating on iTunes as well. That would help us out a great deal. So that'll do it for this episode. Aaron, thanks so much for joining me. Listen, where can people find you on your social medias? 
Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's very easy. There's only one Aaron Sharoni in the world. And so literally, <laughs> so you can find me at Aaron Sharoni on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all over the place. <laughs> and of course, uh, I think there is one other John Campia somewhere, as a matter of fact. But I am the only guy who has the Twitter handle and the Facebook handle and the Instagram handle uh, at John Campia. That's just me. And don't forget, guys, my new book, The Pride, is available on Amazon now. Thank you to all of you guys uh, for purchasing it in the first week. Like it went into the Amazon Top 100 and its categories. Super floored by that. Thank you so much. You can go over there and purchase that right now. Once again, it is The Pride by John Campia. Go check it out. And uh, make sure you subscribe to this podcast follow us on our various YouTubes and Twitters and Facebooks and thanks so much for joining us guys special thanks to you Aaron for being here thank and thank you guys and we will see you next time so for the John Cambia podcast bye bye